I hope everybody can hear me. I, I've been told that uh, this is sometimes early in the morning, and, and I appreciate everybody coming here this early. And I think that, um, as you will see, oftentimes that's when the FBI or the SEC comes to see you as well. I'm going to start off with a story. I have a client who is a, a corporation, which is a corporation, uh, which is based here in New Jersey. But it was very, always very difficult in civil cases to be able to get somebody's attention. That is, I really need these interrogatories answered. I really need to have somebody appear for a deposition. I really need to have somebody answer some questions that I need. But oftentimes these cases are really about money damages or, or employment situations such as sexual harassment or SEPA claims. You know, these are not the focus of the corporate entities. But the story that I'm going to tell you really focused the chairman of the board, the presidents, the vice presidents of this corporation, even clerical people who worked for the CFO. Because it wasn't a civil case, it was a criminal case that was instituted by the Justice Department and the attorney, U.S. Attorney's Office here in, in New Jersey. So I was in my office early in the morning, and, and one of the comptrollers of this company gives me a call and said, the FBI came to my house around 7 o'clock in the morning and wanted to interview me. They told me that they knew that I was involved with bank fraud that we were providing false information to GE Capital with respect to accounts receivable and inventory. And they wanted me to wear a wire against some of the officers of the corporation. Well, since he told me about this, I knew he wasn't wearing a wire, and I asked him to come to my office so that we can discuss the matter. But this is a serious situation. And when he came to my office, I started to debrief him with respect to what they were asking him. And when they were asking him questions concerning monies and data that were being provided back and forth to GE Capital, I, I asked him, well, how did you respond to this? And his response was, well, I don't know anything about this. And that's what he told the FBI. And when and while I was speaking with him, I got a call from the president of the company who told me that 27 FBI agents were executing a search warrant there and that they were seizing the computers, they were seizing the financial information, they had segregated the officers, they had segregated the employees in the cafeteria and were basically looking for information pursuant to a search warrant. As I was driving to the company to meet with the president, who I had asked to look at the search warrant and to find out who the assistant U.S. attorney was, who had signed the papers that went to the court, I called the assistant U.S. attorney's office and said, would you please instruct the FBI not to speak to certain individuals until I have a chance to get there? And her response to me was, well, who are you representing? And I only had one answer to that, and that is the corporation. But, you know, we don't shake hands with corporations. We shake hands with people. And I needed to get information from the corporation, so I had to talk with the assistant U.S. attorney to try to figure out, as I was driving to the corporate headquarters, who might not be a target of their investigation, so that I could identify a corporate officer with whom to communicate. And as I was talking to, ultimately, the president of the corporation, he was adamant. We have done nothing wrong. I know that our finances are in order. I know that there are no issues here. And my response to him was this. A magistrate has already made a determination that probable cause existed that evidence of a crime was located at the corporate headquarters. So let's start from there. We're going to talk today about what you do as corporate counsel, 
or as an employee of a corporation, when the FBI or the SEC or governmental entities come to you to discuss criminal investigations. Because not only will they come to you to talk about matters in which your corporate entity is a target or a witness, but they may come to you because of various regulatory reasons. Oftentimes, corporations who do business with the government have agreements with the government in which they say that certain information has to be disclosed and certain information has to be provided when, when demand is made. We're also going to talk about the United States Department of Justice Memorandum, which provides for U.S. attorneys guidelines as to when and how to prosecute corporations as opposed to prosecuting people. And you're going to see in that presentation that the paradigm is prosecute the corporation unless there's a reason not to. And the job of an attorney representing the corporation is to change that paradigm, which is a very difficult thing to do. As a former prosecutor, and some of you may be former prosecutors here, you may know that once you have a mindset that somebody or something, an entity, has committed a crime, that it's very, very difficult to change your paradigm or change that paradigm because the focus is to look for evidence. So that there's generally three ways that corporations are contacted by law enforcement. Requests for an interview, service of a grand jury subpoena, or execution of a search warrant. The execution of a search warrant is bad. If we want to look at these things from good to bad, number one is good. Number three is bad. Number two is problematic because generally speaking, there is no privilege with respect to documents when documents are subpoenaed by a grand jury. But you know what's worse than X, that number three? Is number three plus walking out of your corporate headquarters in handcuffs. That's really bad. So what does Martha Stewart and Ali Salah Kala Amari have in common? They were both indicted under Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 1001. Al Kalari was charged with lying during his interview after 9-11 about the timing of a previous trip that he had made to the United States. Not whether he was a terrorist, not whether or not he was somebody who was inclined to do harm here, but he was indicted for lying about the timing of trips to the United States. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in light of the fact that, remember that comptroller that I was telling you about? And he told the FBI that he didn't know anything about statements that were made to a bank. That was a lie, too. And under this particular statute, lying to federal authority is a crime. Because by the time the government is talking to you, they already have information. They may act dumb when they're asking you questions, but they will know oftentimes when you tell them something that's not true. And this is how the government makes cases. They make cases by having somebody who may have told them untruths and have lied and saying to them, you're going to be indicted, you're going to go to jail unless you help us in the course of the investigation. The FBI is organized with the way that it conducts their interviews. Sometimes they're too organized. I will tell you that there are times that, I, that I've had, uh, do, you remember, do you remember the Ed Rollins investigation? Ed Rollins was the guy that was Christy Whitman's campaign director here in New Jersey, and the issue was whether or not he was trying to influence minority voting in New Jersey. And the FBI came into an interview of Christy Whitman with a list of questions, and the questions were, 
you know, did you go to a, a location on such and such a date? The answer was no. And then the next question was, well, what did you do at that location? You know, they're, they're very rigid sometimes in the way that they, but, but, they're, but they're very prepared. The lie does not have to be made directly to an employee of the federal government. It can be made with respect to submissions that are made. And the question is whether or not the statement has the natural tendency to influence or is capable of influencing the decision-making body to which it is addressed. Basically, it says you don't have to show that you influenced anybody. All you have to do is to demonstrate that it could have. And for that, you could go to jail. And Martha Stewart went to jail because she lied with respect to knowledge concerning insider trading. So assume that you're a former employee of a corrupt company. You hated the place. You left as soon as you could and did your best while you were there not to participate in any of the activity that you saw around you. However, it was part of your responsibility to provide data to a bank, or part of your responsibility to communicate in some way which transmitted false information. You left the company, but at some point in time, an FBI agent or somebody from the SEC comes to see you and asks about this. So what do you do? You may very well do what this comptroller did for the company that I represented. And that is to say, I don't know anything about this, or to say something that's not true. Or you, as corporate counsel, may be in a situation in which you know that an employee, an officer, or a representative of a company is going to be making statements or is approached by a law enforcement authority and is going to be making statements. So the first thing that happens, and I will tell you from experience, in most cases, in many cases, the employee or the officer may lie. It's, it's like the story is, is, you know, why would anybody with drugs in the trunk of their car give permission to the state police to let them open the trunk? It's because under the circumstances, you feel that you need to cooperate. You feel as though if you don't cooperate, or if you don't make a statement, or if you don't seem ominous, they are going to look at you in some bad way. But the problem it is, is that you are not in a position to judge whether or not your past conduct might be criminal. That's number one. Remember I told you that if you transmit information that may be suspect to a bank, even if you're just delivering it to be mailed, even though you know that the information that's contained is false, that's a crime. But you may not realize that. Quite bluntly, I did not realize that until I became involved in those types of prosecutions. That simply by delivering something that I might be inculpated if I know that there is something that's false in the information being delivered. You may very well make unwittingly factual mistakes. Remember I told you that the FBI was very prepared when they come to talk to you? They may have spoken to other people, and those other persons may not have communicated that to you. They may have tape recordings in which they hear you say X, and because X and that conversation about X took place two years ago, you may not remember it properly. And then all of a sudden, you're talking about why. And then we go back to the statute for which you can be indicted for providing false information to law enforcement. The way that I recommend that these matters be approached, unless it is something that you as a corporate attorney or somebody who works for you is sure does not involve allegations of criminal conduct concerning you, is you decline the request to speak. There is nothing that can't be told to law enforcement 
two hours later or a day later that is going to adversely affect their investigation. Now they're going to give you pressure. They're going to say, well, wait a minute. You're innocent here. You have nothing to hide. Why won't you talk to us? Don't take that bait because they are trained to be able to have you talk about the substance for which they are inquiring. 